The United States is supporting a dictatorship in the South American nation of Ecuador. This is one of the very few remaining governments in Latin America that is controlled by the right wing. Ecuador's president is a multimillionaire banker named Guillermo Lasso, who has been credibly accused of corruption. He is closely linked to organized crime and drug trafficking. Inside Ecuador, Lasso's name is basically synonymous with corruption. In fact, in the three big leaks of offshore tax shelter information in the past few years, which were the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, and the Pandora Papers, Guillermo Lasso was named in all three of them, and he has been connected to numerous shell companies in offshore tax shelters where he has stashed millions of dollars to prevent taxation. Now, given the extensive evidence showing Guillermo Lasso's link to organized crime, this May, he was facing an official legal investigation and was potentially going to be impeached over his involvement in corruption. So what did he do? He decided to dissolve the parliament. Ecuador has a unicameral legislature, which is called the National Assembly. And in elections, numerous opposition parties won the majority in the National Assembly. The biggest party in the parliament is a left-wing party led by former president Rafael Correa, which is the main opposition to Guillermo Lasso. So instead of trying to work within the democratically elected legislature, President Lasso decided simply to be a dictator and to dissolve the elected parliament. And now he is ruling by decree. There are no checks on his power. He is a dictator. And he allegedly said he's going to be holding elections in a few months, potentially in August, which is mandated by the Constitution. However, we'll see if those elections happen. In fact, Ecuador's military released a video publicly supporting Lasso, showing top generals saying that they stand by the president as he dissolves the parliament and declares a dictatorship and rule by decree. But the real scandal that we should talk about is how the U.S. government is supporting him 100 percent in the dis dissolution of the parliament and the creation of a right wing dictatorship. Immediately after President Lasso dissolved democracy, the U.S. ambassador in Ecuador, Mike Fitzpatrick, released a statement stating the U.S. government respects the internal and constitutional processes of Ecuador. We will continue working with the constitutional government, civil society, the private sector, emphasis on the private sector, and the Ecuadorian people to confront our shared challenges and objectives like democracy, security, and economic development, including protecting the environment. And here is the real important quote in this statement. The bilateral relationship between the United States and Ecuador remains strong. So statements like this show how it doesn't matter if a Democrat or Republican is in the White House. The U.S. State Department will continue supporting right wing dictators across Latin America and the world as long as they serve U.S. economic and political interests. Guillermo Lasso has been one of Washington's closest allies in Latin America at a time when the vast majority of the governments in the region are run by left wing political parties that are critical of U.S. imperialism and U.S. meddling. And to understand why the Joe Biden administration, like the Donald Trump administration, has continued supporting these right wing forces across the region, I should point out that from 2007 until 2017, Ecuador was governed by a leftist president, Rafael Correa, who referred to himself as a socialist who formed a close alliance with China and he joined an economic alliance with Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Bolivia, and they were doing trade in Latin America in a new currency they created called the Sucre in order to get off of their dependence on the U.S. dollar. And in 2010, the United States backed a violent coup attempt that unsuccessfully tried to overthrow Correa, 
And ever since he left office in 2017, Washington has been meddling in Ecuadorian politics to prevent his left-wing political movement, which is known as the Citizens' Revolution, from returning to power. Now, I really want to stress here that Guillermo Lasso is one of the least popular leaders in all of Latin America. According to a poll that was conducted before he dissolved parliament, it found that he only has 14% support. Just 1% of Ecuadorians think he's doing a very good job, and 13% of Ecuadorians think he's doing a good job. Meanwhile, he has an 85% disapproval rating. The poll found that 52% of Ecuadorians say he's doing a bad job, and 33% say he's doing a very bad job. Lasso is so unpopular that this February, there were regional elections in Ecuador, and his right-wing party, which is called Creo, I believe, and his right-wing allies were crushed in the regional elections, and instead, the leftist Correista movement won in a landslide. And in the same regional elections, there was also a referendum in which there were eight different changes to the constitution that Lasso tried to put to a vote. And he lost every single proposed change to the constitution. All eight of them were voted down by the Ecuadorian people. This was a devastating political loss for Lasso, and it showed just how unpopular he is in Ecuador. And since Guillermo Lasso became president in 2021, the country has been suffering through growing poverty, inequality, and violence. According to United Nations data cited by the World Bank, in 2008, the first year after Correa entered power, the homicide rate was 18 per 100,000 people. And in his 10 years of rule, the leftist Correa managed to drop the homicide rate to just one third of what it had been when he entered, dropping from 18 to six. And ever since the right wing came to power in 2017, the homicide rate has skyrocketed. And as of 2021, the first year of Guillermo Lasso's rule, it was 14 and it has continued increasing since then. Under Lasso, there has been an epidemic of massacres, especially in prisons, which are linked to drug cartels. And the president himself has been linked to organized crime and drug trafficking. Guillermo Lasso was previously the longtime president of one of the largest, most powerful banks in Ecuador, which is Banco Guayaquil. This is based in the city of Guayaquil, which is a western port city. It's very important for Ecuador's economy, and it's also a center of right-wing politics. Now, we don't know just how rich Guillermo Lasso is because he's notorious for holding millions of dollars of wealth in offshore tax havens in violation of Ecuadorian law. However, we do know that he has at least tens of millions. At the very least, a minimum would be $40 million in wealth, although that's probably a gross understatement considering how much wealth he has stashed abroad. And we should also keep in mind that his family members from the Lasso dynasty have millions of dollars as well and are also linked closely to corruption. By the way, we should keep in mind that we're talking about a country, Ecuador, where the minimum wage is just over 400 US dollars per month, per month. So that means that the minimum wage for Ecuadorian workers is about $2 an hour. Meanwhile, they're governed by a corrupt right-wing banker who has tens of millions of dollars and perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars in wealth. Now, the statement from the US embassy supporting the dictatorship in Ecuador is extremely hypocritical when you consider that the United States supported a coup in Ecuador's neighbor, Peru, against the democratically elected left-wing president, Pedro Castillo, back in December of 2022, just a few months before. Castillo cited his country's constitution in order to temporarily legally dissolve the Congress and hold new elections, and in response, the Western media, the U.S. government, and right-wing forces in Peru 
accused him of launching a coup and the military overthrew him, imprisoned him for 18 months without trial and installed an unelected coup regime that has refused to hold new elections and has massacred more than 60 protesters with the full backing of the United States. So there is a flagrant double standard here. The United States claimed that Peru's democratically elected left-wing president was violating democracy when he cited the Constitution in order to dissolve the Congress and hold new elections, and the U.S. supported the imprisonment and overthrow of him by the military. However, when Ecuador's right-wing multimillionaire president does the exact same thing and is supported by the military as he declares a dictatorship, the U.S. government strongly supports him. The double standard could not be any clearer. Corrupt right-wing multimillionaires are allowed to dissolve Congress, but democratically elected left-wing presidents citing the Constitution legally are not allowed to do the same thing. And what shows how this is even more ridiculous is how there were no credible accusations of corruption against Peru's leftist president, Pedro Castillo, who was a poor teacher from a rural area. He's not a multimillionaire, whereas there were very real allegations of corruption against the, the banker multimillionaire president of Ecuador. And in order to prevent the investigation into his corruption and to prevent the impeachment over his corruption, he dissolved the parliament and the United States supported it. Now, we should also keep in mind the historical context because Lasso is not only notorious in Ecuador because of his recent links to corruption, but his links to corruption go back to 1999 when Ecuador went through a complete bankruptcy. Millions of Ecuadorians lost their life savings in a financial crash known as the Feriado Bancario, the bank crash. This happened in 1999. And the currency of Ecuador, the Sucre, was completely devalued. And there was a bank run and infamous photos with long lines of Ecuadorians trying to withdraw their savings from collapsing banks. And can you guess who oversaw the financial crash in 1999? You guessed it, Guillermo Lasso. At the time, he was not only the economic minister, but he was frequently referred to as the super economic minister who oversaw the economic policies of the right-wing neoliberal government as the banking system collapsed and the Ecuadorian people lost their life savings in 1999. However, there were some people who profited from the 1999 financial crash, including Guillermo Lasso and his banker friends who made millions of dollars as their country was going bankrupt. And furthermore, Guillermo Lasso, as super economic minister, dollarized the country in response to the 1999 crash. That is to say that still today, two decades later, Ecuador does not have a sovereign currency. Its currency is the U.S. dollar. It has no monetary sovereignty. And it was Guillermo Lasso who decided to dollarize the economy back in 1999. Now, I mentioned earlier that we really don't know how much wealth Guillermo Lasso has because he stashed so much of it in offshore tax shelters. However, what we do know is that in the United States alone, he has at least $30 million worth of properties. The Washington, D.C. based think tank, the Center for Economic and Policy Research, which is one of the only good independent think tanks in Washington, reported back in 2017 that Lasso was linked to 28 holding companies that own 144 properties in Florida that are valued at more than $30 million. And the report pointed out that this is likely an undervaluation. They're probably worth even more. In 2021, when Lasso was once again running for president, the Center for Economic and Policy Research published another report that showed that four years later, Lasso had even more properties in Florida that were owned by shell companies he was linked to. Now, in that 2017 elections, 
Ecuadorian voters approved a referendum that bans politicians and government officials from holding assets in tax havens, and it gave them one year to divest or transfer their holdings. However, four years after the Ecuadorian people approved that law, Guillermo Lasso still had 30 plus million dollars worth of properties in Florida, which is notorious for being considered a low tax jurisdiction, which is basically, you know, a fancier way of saying a tax haven. So the Center for Economic and Policy Research report said this could very well be a violation of Ecuadorian law, one of many carried out by Lasso and his corrupt cronies. The Center for Economic and Policy Research also pointed out in the 2017 report that Guillermo Lasso and his family members are owners of a bank in Panama called Banisi, despite the fact that in 2014, Ecuador passed new regulations preventing banks from having subsidiaries in tax havens like Panama. This means that Lasso and his family members were likely violating Ecuadorian law. And furthermore, Lasso claimed in 2012 that he was going to be retiring from banking and he stopped being the president of Banco Guayaquil. However, he still is the largest shareholder in that bank. Now, all of these well-documented examples of corruption have been known for years. However, this January 2023, another massive corruption scandal exploded in Ecuador directly involving President Lasso. This scandal is referred to in Ecuador as the Gran Padrino, which means the Great Godfather. And at the center of it is Danilo Carrera Druet, who is the brother-in-law of Lasso. He is married to Lasso's sister. And Danilo Carrera is himself a longtime friend and business partner of Lasso and a major shareholder in Lasso's former bank, Banco Guayaquil. Now, this January, local media outlets in Ecuador published a series of audio recordings and documents and reports that show how Lasso and the great godfather Carrera were essentially stealing millions of dollars from the Ecuadorian government by forging false documents and giving millions of dollars of contracts, government contracts worth to companies owned by Carrera and Lasso's family members and friends and allies. This is a clear cut case of corruption. It doesn't get much more blatant than this. And this is why the Ecuadorian National Assembly was initiating an investigation into Lasso over corruption. It would have very likely led to him being impeached for corruption. So he decided to use the nuclear option and he dissolved the parliament, declaring a dictatorship in which now he is governing by decree until there's an election. So this is why the United States and right wing defenders of Lasso are claiming that what he did was constitutional because there is an article in the Constitution, which is known as the Muerte Cruzada, which means the crossed death that says that in certain circumstances, in very specific circumstances, the president can dissolve the National Assembly in order to hold new elections. And he invoked, Lasso invoked this article in the Constitution, the crossed death, Muerte Cruzada, in order to declare dictatorship. However, in order to do that, Lasso absurdly claimed that Ecuador is facing a, a state of, quote, grave internal commotion, grave internal commotion. There is no grave internal commotion. That would be like if there were violent riots going on, but nothing like that is actually happening in Ecuador. That was the excuse he used to invoke this article of the constitution in order to prevent very serious allegations of corruption, shown proof of corruption being investigated by the government and to prevent himself from being impeached. Now, the absurd irony of this is that this is exactly what Peru's leftist president, Pedro Castillo, was falsely accused of. He never had been in any way linked to corruption. Pedro Castillo is a poor 
farmer and teacher from a rural area in Peru, whereas Guillermo Lasso is a multimillionaire banker with a long history of links to corruption. However, not only the U.S. government, but also U.S. government propaganda media outlets have been defending Ecuador's dictatorship and Lasso's dissolution of democracy while simultaneously claiming that what Pedro Castillo did was not legitimate. Voice of America, which is a U.S. government propaganda outlet created by the CIA, published an article claiming that the difference is that what Lasso did was constitutional, whereas what Castillo did was not constitutional, which is completely false. It's a lie. And Voice of America said that the other main difference is that in Ecuador, the military is supporting Lasso as he dissolves parliament, whereas in Peru, the military turned against the elected president, Castillo, and overthrew him in a coup. And obviously, yeah, I mean, that is a difference. In fact, Ecuador's military released a video publicly supporting Lasso, showing top generals saying that they stand by the president as he dissolves the parliament and declares a dictatorship and rule by decree. And by the way, as I showed in a separate report, which I'll link to in the description below, the U.S. ambassador to Peru is a so-called former CIA agent, although we all know that there's really no such thing as a former CIA agent. Her name is Lisa Kenna, and before she joined the State Department, she was a CIA agent. And one day before the coup in Peru against Pedro Castillo, she met with the defense minister of Peru, and on the day of the coup, the defense minister ordered the military to disobey the president's orders and to overthrow him and imprison him without a trial. And then immediately after the coup, the CIA agent turned U.S. ambassador in Peru, Lisa Kenna, met with the ministers of mining and energy in Peru to discuss how Western corporations can invest more in the mining sector in Peru. And Peru is one of the world's largest producers of copper and also that one of the biggest producers of liquefied natural gas in Latin America. Now, while the U.S. government and the right wing in Ecuador are falsely claiming that Pedro Castillo illegally tried to dissolve the Congress in Peru. In fact, Article 134 of the Peruvian Constitution says very clearly, I quote, the president of the republic has the ability to dissolve the Congress if this institution, that is the Congress, has censured, that is taken action against, or denied its confidence in two councils of ministers. That's the legal name for the cabinet in Peru. And the Congress in Peru did precisely that multiple times. So Pedro Castillo was legally allowed to dissolve the Congress as long as he called for new elections, which is exactly what he did in his speech. He said there would be new elections within nine months. However, the U.S. government didn't care. The Ecuadorian right wing doesn't care and the Peruvian right wing didn't care. He was overthrown in a violent coup. And after the coup, the Peruvian coup regime with the full backing of the US massacred at least 60 different protesters, sending out thousands of troops and militarized police to brutalize pro-democracy protesters in Peru. And in fact, while the U.S. government is supporting the coup regime in Peru, which was never elected and refuses to hold elections, the corrupt right wing controlled Supreme Court in Peru just declared this May that protests are illegal. There is no legal support for protests and anyone who protests the coup regime in Peru can now be imprisoned legally in scare quotes, because the Supreme Court said it's illegal to protest the unelected right wing coup regime. And as if that hypocrisy wasn't already enough, it came to a whole new level when the foreign ministry in Peru's unelected coup regime published a statement saying the government of Peru reiterates its support for the democratic process in the brotherly republic of Ecuador expressing full support for Lasso as he dissolves democracy and declares a dictatorship in Ecuador. So the double standards cannot be any more blatant. What the United States is saying is 
if corrupt multimillionaire right wing bankers who are US allies dissolve democracy and create a dictatorship, Washington will support them and claim what they're doing is constitutional democratic. However, if a democratically elected left wing president who is poor from a rural area, who is a union organizer like Pedro Castillo, if he constitutionally invokes Article 134 of the Constitution in order to prevent a coup against him by the corrupt right wing controlled Congress, which had 7% approval in Peru. Then the CIA agent turned US ambassador in Peru strongly supports the coup and the imprisonment of the elected president, as long as he's left wing, the imprisonment of him without trial. And then the U.S. supports an unelected coup regime that massacres protesters and refuses to hold elections. I should also point out the element of racism here. Pedro Castillo in Peru is of indigenous descent. He represents the majority of the population of Peru and much of Latin America, which is dark skinned and of indigenous descent, whereas the wealthy oligarchs are disproportionately of European descent and light skinned like Guillermo Lasso. And they're never portrayed as dictators. And the media has not accused Guillermo Lasso of launching a coup, even though all of the mainstream corporate media outlets in both English and Spanish falsely accused Pedro Castillo of supposedly launching a coup when he was the victim of a US backed military coup. So this is the reality in Latin America. It is simply neo-colonialism. The United States supports right wing dictatorships whenever it serves its economic and political interests. And anytime a democratically elected left wing president comes to power, immediately there are nonstop attempts to try to overthrow them, to prevent them from governing. And eventually, when they do get overthrown, to imprison them without trial. And this is also a very similar story in Ecuador. The leftists who governed from 2007 until 2017, Rafael Correa, constantly faced right wing coup attempts. There was a violent coup attempt involving the police and parts of the military in 2010 that was backed by the US that failed. But then there were also constant lawfare attacks, that is judicial warfare attacks against Correa and his leftist movement, which is known as the Citizens Revolution. And then when Correa left power in 2017, there was a kind of internal coup by his former vice president, Lenin Moreno, who was a complete traitor and who was working hand in glove with the United States in order to sabotage Ecuador, privatizing everything, selling off state assets, imposing neoliberal right wing economic policies, legally persecuting and exiling large numbers of Ecuadorian leftists from Correa's Citizens Revolution Party and trying to imprison Correa, exiling him. He's now in Belgium, which is where his wife is from, and he can't go back to his country because of numerous fake lawsuits against him, including I'm not joking. This is a real, real fact in Ecuador. The corrupt right wing controlled judicial system accused the leftist former president Rafael Correa of psychic influence, influjo psíquico, over his supporters, psychic influence, and they want to imprison him for that, for psychic influence, like he's from X-Men. These are the neo-colonial banana republics that the United States wants Latin America to be ruled by, like in Ecuador and like in Peru, which are two dictatorships strongly supported by the US and its corporations that are profiting as the people of these countries suffer. However, eventually, both countries are going to be forced to hold elections. Eventually, they're simply holding on to power as long as they can. And what's very likely in both elections is that the left is going to come to power because the US cannot maintain its neo-colonial control over Latin America. The people of the region have woken up. They refuse to be the imperial subjects of the US empire. That explains the wave of leftist anti-imperialist governments all across Latin America. Rafael Correa in Ecuador was part of that wave. And it's simply a matter of time until they come back. The tragic question is how much do the people of Ecuador and Peru have to suffer? How many pro-democracy protesters are going to be killed by these US backed dictatorships? until they finally agree 
to leave power and flee to Florida, which is where they all go, to live in their mansions. Well, on that rather pessimistic, but also kind of optimistic note, I'm gonna conclude here. I'm Ben Norton, the editor of Geopolitical Economy Report. If you like the work that we do here, we have no institutional support. We have no big sponsors. We rely entirely on listeners and viewers like you. So please consider going to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support. The best way to support us is you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy. And please, on whatever platform you're watching or listening to this on, please subscribe. It helps to promote our reporting in the algorithm. I want to thank everyone. I'll see you all next time.